the long guy like Lua, Tony to my moon wreath. Nah, of course it wasn't. At 10 past 10 next Monday evening here on BBC One Northern Ireland, the second documentary in the series Art on Film looks at one of the great clichés that surrounds Irish people, that they are great storytellers. The story of storytelling in Ireland is told in Between Heaven and Woolworths, next Monday's Art on Film, and that's at 10 past 10. Our classic movie presentation coming up... Ben Hardy getting somewhat muddled over a question of nuptials. <laughs> and I don't know if he's become somewhat confused now on BBC Two as we continue the... ...by the arguments of uh, Gerald O'Collins uh, in his book The Easter Jesus where he says that the, the reason he would like to hold on to the value of the statement of the resurrection of the body is that it, it represents the idea that what Christ achieved, the redemption of Christ, um, doesn't allow us to escape from, from uh, this world. It's not a, a copping out uh, of death, of, this, of the difficulty part of the, the story of Jesus or of our own story that resurrection um, is meant to include everything. It's a transformation of everything we are and have been. What does resurrection mean to you? It means that Jesus Christ is alive. He's not just alive if something was sing about him in him, but he's alive in here in my life, in my heart. And I know that wherever I go, I sing a little song to him sometimes that says this. It says, wherever I may travel, wherever I may roam, I know with God beside me, I'll never walk alone. And though the skies are darker, and though the skies are grey, I know that if he guides me, I'll never lose my way, for I walk with his hand in mine. I let him down, dear, every day. But he never lets me down. He's always there to help me along the way. If Christ be not risen, then our preaching is in vain, that you're believing it is in vain. Uh, the, the, the resurrection is, is what we essentially believe in. That's what we celebrate in our worship. That's what is the, the it's, it's, it's in the power of the resurrection that we pray. And it's in the power of that resurrection that we believe in human beings, in their infinite worth, their dignity, their value. That's the source of our faith in the sacredness of human life, in the sacredness and preciousness of the human body. It's not a body that's going to perish, it's a body that's going to live with Christ, transformed forever. And though for care of the body, concern for the body, the beauty of the body, the health of the body, respect for the body, my own and that of others, is part of my faith in the resurrection of Christ. I would see the resurrection of faith and the resurrection as being our daring to believe that the way that leads Jesus to your personal development, encouraging young people to become proactive in their community through youth work or other programs. FAB's integrated playgroup brings together youngsters, allowing for acceptance and opportunities for preschool and school age children. With the help of volunteers, many of FAB's projects are supported, including the educational aspects of our work. The colourful characters of kids on the block with their puppeteers deliver disability awareness training to schools, groups and professional organisations throughout the province and we continue to appeal for individuals to come forward to train in this aspect of our work. It's great to have the chance to, to live independently. It means I can have my own space but I'm able to keep studying. I can get support. there was another surprise. This young man could memorize the entire list in a mere 10 seconds. By comparing young and old, the researchers found that old, unimpaired people can learn new strategies for memory. Their accuracy can be as good as young subjects. The only difference between old and young in this case is the speed at which new memories are encoded. We believe that there is continued potential for positive change, for new learning, but at a reduced rate and in fewer territories of the mind, most likely. 
The positive change with age, as the 17th century Dutch master Rembrandt observed in himself, begins long before old age. For the artist, the gathering maturity might have been no more than a passage of being, the grave impress of time. Today, Rembrandt students and modern scientists may share two beliefs. In old age, creativity need not diminish and wisdom may flourish. Before our eyes, Rembrandt's technique grows in subtlety. Vanities fade. And within this life passage is evoked the fermentation of experience, the encumbrance of self-doubt. From these brushstrokes of self emerges Rembrandt's particular wisdom, punctuated just before death by the master's final offering, the unforgiving statement of who he is and how he had come to be. Wisdom for me foremost is a state of knowledge about the human condition, about how it comes about, which factors shape it, how one deals with difficult problems, and how one organizes one's life in such a manner that when we are old, we judge it to be meaningful. You know, on this cart that you see alongside me, uh, of the, this week's accumulation, uh, there are better than 100 cases, every one of which I have to look at. For a justice of the United States Supreme Court, wisdom has come to mean the distillation of a lifetime's experience. And I do this every week. And I have no difficulty handling it. If anything, I expect the uh, experience I, I add to year after year as I've just made it uh, a rather uh, easier. The wise person evaluates the situation in its own light, not coming from a predetermined position. That's the essence of wisdom, to be sure you're looking at the current situation in its own light. So it's very difficult to be wise if you're doctrinaire. It's difficult to be wise if you're impulsive, to be so bound and determined by your own motivation. It's also very difficult to be wise if you don't have enough experience. Not all people make it. Not all old people are wise just because they're old. But some do, and for me, that's the fruition of life. There is no denying, however, that even with wisdom, certain elements of mind may erode with age. Some scientists, like Robert Sapolsky, believe this process of decline may be in part a result of the way we react to our environment. Sapolsky is examining hormones called glucocorticoids released by the adrenal gland near the kidneys, a gland that may have a profound bearing on our mind's ability to survive. Glucocorticoid secretion during stress is absolutely critical for everything your body has to do to get out of a stressful emergency. But just as importantly, it's become clear too much glucocorticoids, too much stress causing secretion of glucocorticoids is critical to everything that gets us sick with chronic stress. Let me give you an example. Suppose you're a gazelle. You're running across the savanna trying to escape from a predator. High blood pressure is exactly what you want at that point. You want to increase your cardiovascular tone because you want to get more nutrients, you want to get more oxygen getting to every part of your body. It's exactly the response you want under those conditions of a stressful emergency. Do the exact same thing, raise your blood pressure instead for 30 years being an executive, worrying about your mortgage, and you have stress-induced hypertension. Not exactly what you want under those circumstances. Clearly, a short-term stressor what glucocorticoids do are very, very functional, very efficient. Do it chronically and you get sick. What I found out in recent years is that one of the most interesting consequences of overexposure to glucocorticoids are that these hormones may actually kill cells in the brain. In the laboratory, Sapolsky injected glucocorticoids around nerve cells in areas of the brain crucial to the encoding, storage, and retrieval of memories. He found these stress hormones interfered with the nerve cell's ability to store energy. And as a result, their efficiency in numbers declined steadily. 
Once he knew that such damage could occur in an experimental situation, he then asks, can social stress, the kind of stress associated with human interaction, also account for the death of some brain cells? What I wound up studying was a population of baboons living in a national park in East Africa, the Serengeti. If you're a baboon, living in the Serengeti is about as great of a place as you can hope to wind up in. The food is terrific. They don't have a lot of problems with predators. The infant mortality rate is low. Overwhelmingly, they have, in effect, an affluent enough of a society that they've got the free time to generate social stress for themselves. Sapolsky's Kenyan research assistant, Richard Konis, bicycles every day of the year to spend the daylight hours with the troop. By now, Konis can identify each baboon by name, and they, in turn, have accepted him. Between the two of us, we've now spent a substantial portion of the lifespan of these animals observing them. Most of all, you get a very good sense of their dominance hierarchies. Who's high ranking, who's low ranking, what sort of stressors they're exposed to in their lives. Once you have that information, what you then ask is, what does their social behavior, what does their level of stress have to do with how well their bodies cope with stress? Sapolsky joins Konis in Kenya once a year to capture each baboon in order to measure its stress response. This information is then assessed in light of the baboon's status in the troop. It's pretty clear to me at this stage, in terms of conclusions, if I were to be a baboon, I would want to be a high-ranking one. Consistently, there's tremendous differences in the physiology of these animals, depending on their social rank. And in system after system, it's the high-ranking animals that have the more efficient stress responses. Suppose it does turn out that even in the primate brain, in the human brain, that glucocorticoids, stress, could actually damage your brain cells. What can you do about it? There's at least two things. The first is to take this whole problem of how can you fix a damaged brain cell. And that's essentially what I'm trying to find out in the laboratory. And not surprisingly, this is a fairly high-tech approach to trying to repair damaged tissue. But just as importantly, probably even more importantly in terms of things that we can do to change our own outcome of health, is whether or not you wind up getting that damaged neuron in the first place. It would be ironic if after all of this laboratory work, all this high-tech biochemistry, and on the other hand, all of this work with something as unlikely as a troop of baboons, if the take-home message is our grandmothers were basically right all along when they told us we should be happy and we should relax and we should just take things in stride. That might be basically the lesson. But what about an old age without stress of any kind? Is that the solution? At 78, Bob Philly has everything he ever wanted in his retirement. And with everything, he has sculpted a world with few demands, little schedule, and now hardly a purpose. I worked on this on a freighter coming back from the Baltic about five years ago. And uh, I've always wanted to work on the thing and finish it. And I knew that when I were retired, I would have time to do this. But when actual retirement came, I had other things like watering the lawns and these other things, and I never got up to it. This is just one of the many uh, number of things that I wanted to do and which I'd hoped to do and which I'm going to do. Bob Philly's resolution is tied to the new life he and his wife are planning far away in a different kind of place. It is not a sad moment for me to, to move from this house and go into a retirement home. The retirement home is a lively, happy place. And uh, it isn't like you're going to a dungeon. It's, uh, it's going to be a new life with new experiences and new friends. A new beginning for the Phillies. Is there any scientific basis to suggest that such a change in life may have any effect on their minds. William Greenow may have made a startling discovery about this. The conventional wisdom was that the brain developed, the connections between neurons were formed, and the brain stayed pretty much stable throughout life after that until the aging process came along and, and connections began to disappear. The thing that surprised us when we began to work with this was that in fact, connections apparently continue to form throughout the majority, if not absolutely all, of the life of the brain. And I think what our work shows is that 
the adult brain is a very, very dynamic place with, uh, with connections forming and dying on a regular basis. These connections are called synapses, the minute gaps separating one nerve cell from another, the gaps that are indeed the dynamic edge of brain in action. What we think more synapses translates into is adding experience or the residue of experience, memories, information to the very structure of the brain. That is, the wiring diagram of the brain is a function of its incorporated history. It's the, the circuit upon which behavior is based. And when we make new connections, what we're doing is adding new possibilities, new information, new potential to the organization of the system. Scientists have long known Scientists have long known that when young rats are removed from a dull, confined cage and put into an exciting environment, they form new brain connections. It was assumed that the brains of old rats had lost this ability to form new connections. This rat, which is approaching middle age, has lived in a cage all of its life. It's sort of equivalent to a human that has lived in the same room or the same house without ever having a chance to get outside. What we did in a pair of experiments was to take rats like this and transfer them either at middle age or in elderly years to a complex environment, sort of rat equivalent of Disneyland for a human being, in order to see what would happen to their brains. When we first put the old animals in the complex environment, they immediately hide under the toys, uh, avoid any kind of interaction, and, and, and freeze. Gradually, they realize nothing bad is going to happen. They begin to explore the environment, uh, socialize with each other. Over time, they become more active, begin to literally run around their environment, play, as this happens, you can see them beginning to push a little bit. They haven't exercised uh, previously. They're sort of like uh, couch potatoes that are put in the circus for the first time. When you can sort of feel these big, old, overweight rats puffing as they wander around their environment. And as time goes on, the animals actually begin to regain some of the sleekness they might have had if they were athletes for the, for the, when they were young. They lose weight. Uh, they become somewhat more agile, though not overwhelmingly so, and seem very subjectively. It seems like they're more alert and maybe happier, like they're really enjoying life for the first time. The result of this experiment was startling. Looking in one region of brain, Greenow found the rats had developed 2,000 more synapses per neuron than rats which remain confined in small cages. We take that figure, 2,000 synapses per neuron, and we assume that for every neuron in the brain, that same range actually exists. Then the difference, the dynamic range of the brain as a whole, is in the general area of many trillions of synapses. These are not trivial effects. The extraordinary increase in the numbers of connections can be appreciated when the sparsely connected neurons in the brains of old, confined animals are compared to the complex connections of other old animals who've enjoyed an enriched environment. In these, the large gaps have, for the most part, been filled in. We believe that these synapses represent the incorporation of new information into the wiring diagram of the brain, a, a kind of, of memory. I think that what we can conclude from the work at this point is that mental activity promotes good mental function. Mental exercise, like physical exercise, makes for a healthier brain. Good going, good. 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 So we now know that an active, purposeful old age is required to achieve the potential of the healthy aging brain. Retirement communities that make physical and especially intellectual demands on the individual 
are actually applying findings from our growing understanding of brain and mind. Of Golda Meir. She was born Golda Mabovic in Pinsk, Russia in 1898. Bob and Virginia Philly moved to just such a place after they sold their house. It's a very active place. Every week they print a schedule and I keep it on the refrigerator, so I'm constantly aware of what's going on each day, all day long. It'll keep me busy all the time. You have to choose. You can't go to everything. There isn't time. Hello, Hello Anne. How are you tonight? My husband is enjoying himself, I think, a lot more here because he has time and uh, I think he's sharper. There is this joy in working on a, an object that you are helping to create. And uh, it gives you uh, excitement as you lay up each uh, plank on the thing. It's going to look beautiful. Bob Philly will finish his ship's model. He's found an environment where he can continue learning, developing, adapting, and pushing. His aging mind, we now know, possesses the capacity to change. But what about the obvious limitations on someone at such an age? While wisdom and creativity, for example, may indeed be enriched, many other abilities inevitably decline. Won't old age, therefore, always mean a time of frustration when aspirations can never be achieved? Bert Brim has been focusing on just this area of the psychology of aging. The example set by one member of his family has become for him a metaphor for success in old age. My father, when he first came to this place, was about 60, and he had retired, and he set out right away to clean up the forest and to clean up the fence rows and the lanes the way he'd been taught to do as a boy on a farm in Ohio. And he would start up this lane that's over here and on up. And he used to go all the way up to the top of, up this lane and up and then through the top of the mountains up here. And he'd set out in the morning with his axes and his saws and his size and come back at night having spent a day's effort on this during my father's 80s as his physical capacity began to diminish he began to work more and more here around the house he began to plant large flower gardens and he planted vegetable gardens so that he felt fulfilled here in this area just the way he did when he was roaming the mountaintops 20 years earlier. When my father hit his 100th birthday, his concentration turned to these window boxes in this patio area around the house. This is his farm now. He has shifted downward to this level of operation, but it still maintains a vital capacity and growing edge. And today, this father of mine, this grand gentleman, is 103 years old. I have no idea of, of age. I've been a very, very healthy person until I had this stroke. I ought to be pretty well disappointed because I am shut off in a world, in a very, very, very narrow world, who, where, the, where as an educator I've been full of everything. But why think about it? <laughs> I, I can't change it. I have so much. Uh, in spite of the fact that I have so little. It's just, I'm just nice to be here. Look out my tree. Uh -huh. I wish you would come here to see you in the summertime and see us. Huh? It's a beautiful setting, beautiful setting here. It's so interesting to see how this man, my father, and other men in shifting down can still maintain this growing edge and feel fulfilled with lowered aspirations. 
and the successful aging that is demonstrated here is the way in which human beings can keep going while declining gradually. And in this case, symbolically, it seems to us and the family from the mountaintop down to the house. Compensating for the limitations of growing old is a far cry from experiencing the devastating effects of the disease we now call Alzheimer's. For many years, it was believed that if we lived long enough, most of us would succumb to such dementia. Now, leaders in the battle to find a cure for the disease, men like Peter Davies, have dramatically changed the way we view Alzheimer's. I really don't believe for one moment that Alzheimer's disease is a consequence of aging or an extension of the aging process. It's a specific disease quite distinct from any of the effects of age. The effects of age on the brain are minimal, absolutely minimal. If there are many diseases, many pathologic entities that can affect the brains of elderly people. But I do not believe there's good evidence for an effect of age alone on the brain. In my own view, it's entirely possible that Alzheimer's disease is always genetic. But you can't see the genetics, you can't see a pattern of inheritance because the ancestors, the relatives of the patient, simply didn't live long enough to develop, for you to know whether they developed the disorder. We really don't understand how a genetic error that's present throughout life, how that begins to produce a disease, how it begins, what triggers the onset of the disorder. Identical twins, Bert and Hugh, now 81, were raised together and lived not far from each other. One of them must have confronted the trigger for Alzheimer's, for today he exhibits the symptoms of dementia. And we had a, some kind of a thing that we could go up there, but it was too far to go. There's nobody, I don't think, ever went up there at all. I'd go out in the water. No. Well, in looking back on this change in Hugh, it was not perceptible, but something in our relationship had sort of slid apart. Uh, and that would be three years ago or four years ago. By three years ago, there were gaps and phrases and cover-ups on his part. You know, I didn't pay much attention to it. But looking back on it now, it seems to me that this was part of the, the beginning of, of this, of some kind of change of mind. Oh, you'll remember him very well, because he came down to us all the time. Then we went up to Aunt Mary, Mary not Aunt Mary, what was her name? We'd go up there and spend a night or something like that. In Charles River? In Charles River, yeah. And he was, he lived in sort of down, to, there was a water, some water place down in here like this. Hugh has Alzheimer's disease. And the symptoms that he has are very typical for an Alzheimer patient. He has a great deal of difficulty with his memory, and that's gotten gradually worse over time. And he has trouble finding the words to say what he wants to say. He has trouble with naming. And that's also gotten gradually worse as time has progressed. Falling over. Oh, it's marvelous. Out of this world. And here we are in Cohasset in the tree. But this is not us, people much younger. No, it does. That's what I'm trying to figure out. Which is which? I think on this one, yeah. Yeah, I think so, too. And here's Marty and our that's usual... Wrong. No heart, no difficulty to play that game, and here are the Tweedledum and Tweedledee. Yeah, yeah. Remember that? Look, at it was such a relief that she would be safe and cared for that I actually said, fine, we'll go for it. Did you consciously weigh your family's needs against your mother's needs when you were thinking about the home? Yes. Yes, I did. Um, because... Although it's your mother, when you marry, you make a commitment to somebody else. And I'll try and explain this to my daughter. They have to come first because that is... Catherine Grayson is this... Fast om någon är bort sig kan det också vara roligt för de som ser det. Men om man sen börjar njuta av att sätta dit den och samma person hela tiden, då kan man börja prata om mobbing.
Ja, men hör du, flytta på det nu då. Ja, men var nära mig nu då. Här, ta lite. Jo, men snälla, ta lite. Det går. Ja, ta salt nu då. Ta lite grann. Och häll nu då. Häll på lite salt. Det är jättegott. Fan vad kul alltså. Did the kids themselves get involved with scripting their ideas or... No, no, we do that. Once they've given us a topic, we... ...the world. I think it can all make a difference. Do you think you'd ever want to be separating? No, no way. Today at 3.30 on the Oprah Winfrey Show. I once ended up feeding dried dog food to the birds. My dog didn't like the taste, did you? Did you? But since feeding them pedigree chum complete, they never leave any. They love it. <laughs> Our vets and nutritionists at Waltham know taste is important, so dogs get all the nutrients they need. That's why we based every nutritious mouthful in delicious meat juices. Now. ...for independence, it seems that even for Charlie McCreevy, economics takes second place to politics. It's exactly what every Irish government has always done. Whenever they get into trouble, they cut back on capital spending, and we see that in the appalling state of the roads, in our railways, in all of our infrastructure. And we spend years and years afterwards always trying to catch up. There have been hints... <laughs> Give Ferrero Rocher goal behind me here uh, doesn't strike you immediately as a likely headquarters for a world religious movement or cult. That's exactly what it is. We're talking about the Church of Isis, uh, whose members believe that God is a woman. And they would say if more people took that on board, well, the world would be a far better place. Well, uh, the rituals take place in the dungeons here of Huntington and the wonderful and aristocratic rooms and halls above. Well, they are open to the public uh, during the summer months by prior arrangement. Our Rowan Hand has been exploring. Huntington Castle was built in 1625. It was a seat of Irish aristocracy and to this day remains a relic of that bygone age. It's still a home and the history of the family can be traced back to the 1600s. Government grants and private income keep the place intact. There's a palpable tension in the air here, a possible throwback to earlier rows between the clans O'Cavanagh and O'Neill. Or maybe we're experiencing the aura of ghosts of past landlords, servants, wives or mistresses. But Huntington reaches out beyond mere mortal conflict. Earthbound ghosts, trapped and doomed to wander the halls and the landings of the old castle forever, are but little things in the scheme of the infinite. Family member Olivia Robertson, now 86, founded with her brother 30 years ago, the Worldwide Fellowship of Isis, the religious movement that believes in the gentleness, the femininity of the deity. In short, that God is a woman. We are drawn to the castle dungeon that's been transformed into the Temple of Isis in Ireland. Inside, we are to find a labyrinth of gold and silver iconography, a citadel within which one could lose the priestess if not sharp about following quickly on her trail.
takes a minute or two. This is strange indeed. A place of many holy nooks and crannies. Every statue and every picture celebrating what the 25,000 believers worldwide, several hundred in Ireland, take to be the beauty, the goodness and the godliness of womankind. My exploration takes me up through an old well shaft here at Huntington since earlier monastic times. But it is Olivia, the high priestess, who has all the answers. With a bit of luck, I'll find her. It's entirely a power for good. It contradicts warfare, cruelty, abuse of women, and especially child abuse. We are necessary, we women, but we have to be inspired by God in female form. Otherwise, we visualize a patriarch with a beard uh, giving rather fierce laws. Can a man God be a gentle God? Uh, he wouldn't be much of a God if he were. You want a patriarch. You want a strong judge one who stands up for the law and truthfulness. When we use the word goddess, we don't mean the only. You're a god, though you don't know. You've all got the uh, Holy Spirit within, including a dog, a cat, anybody. What kind of things are being achieved through intercession with the gods and goddesses? Friendliness. I've been show I showed around an Iraqi Shiite. We had no problems at all. He said, Allah includes the divine feminine. Uh, so we are bringing harmony, especially through dance, music and the arts, to people of all faiths. So we don't have to have Catholics and Protestants fighting, or Islam and Hindu. There need be no fighting when you accept the goddess. What about after the great adventure of death? Oh, Where do you go? That's what really interests me. I've had actual out-of-the-body experiences, so I know there's a life after death. And I mean, hundreds of people have had that experience, but they don't advertise it because they're told they're hallucinating. People, my brother's still with us. I'm sure he's here now. Yeah. How do you know it was an out-of-body experience? Because I was out of my body completely in full consciousness. Uh, the only difference was I could see in the dark and the light was slightly bluish and with the touch of a hand it's slightly cooler. But no, I don't wonder that people um, don't know they're dead. It's just the same when you first pass on until you go to the place that you tune into, the sphere you have uh, made yours. The heaven you get is the heaven you deserve. Uh, if you're bad, it's like being in a video nasty. But I believe everybody is redeemed in the end, because every being, every atom, has the mother in them. That's the concept of the mother goddess. The god rules, but the goddess is inside you. You're born of woman. Therefore, everybody's saved in the end, but you get a rough time if you're horrible. Mm. Moira, the present owner of Huntington, is no believer in the Fellowship of Isis. But she respects their beliefs. Are you a follower of, uh, of ISIS? No, I'm, I'm, I'm not. I mean, I would certainly sympathize with all forms, all belief forms. I, I find I'm not at all uh, worried about, you know, ISIS. Um, I think the Egyptian mythology is a fascinating one. Um, and I'm interested really in world religions, but I would be Christian myself. I enjoy living here very much indeed. It doesn't have all mod cons, but it has an awful lot else going for it. And part of that awful lot else is history. It's got great history, it really has. Um, it, it was built in 1625 as a garrison, so it would only have had soldiers rattling about in it. And uh, it wasn't really until 1680 that the family came to live here, the Esmonds. The vine was planted here in about the 1860s, and it in turn is a cutting from the old Hampton Court vine, which would have uh, therefore been around when poor old Anne Boleyn was living in Hampton Court. So she would essentially have been eating the same grapes that are growing here today. Well, it's my deepest wish that you don't <laughs> end up with the same fate. Off with our head, yes. <laughs> So today the modern coexists easily with the mystery and intrigue of man's pathway to the stars. Heaven, or the world to come, if you want to call it that. Whatever way you want to take it, there's no one here killing and bombing, and the talk is of gentleness. And certainly the mysteries of Isis, the feminine god, are no more strange... A lot of time, in fact... Briefly.
190,000. The woman's formula. I knocked on it. I was born with a, a burning wish to be a writer myself, but I remember at school I was always trying to win things, you know. And I never thought of writing again until I was in my early 20s. And I was in, uh, working in a kibbutz, uh, teaching a Jewish school in Dublin, and the parents gave me a present of a ticket to Israel uh, for my summer holidays, and I was 23. Now, 23 is a quite a grown-up age, where you think that most people would be considered grown-up enough to go around and see the world for themselves, but not in our family. I mean, this awful uh, agony of it would may be all right, like out in the Middle East, this was discussed for weeks. But I decided that in order to keep them happy and to keep them peaceful at home, I would write to them long letters describing where I was and what I was doing. So I wrote long letters to them and told them all about the kibbutz and the communal farm and how the Jews had come from different parts of the world and how they had made a great life for themselves in the desert. And I wrote it all, the description of how plucking chickens and how uh, picking oranges and taking the children down to the sea and all that. And I wrote it all to my mother and father. And they, of course, because they thought that all their geese were swans, they thought this was the most wonderfully entertaining thing in the world. And they got a type and they said, sent it to a magazine, or sent it to a newspaper, and it was published in a newspaper when I came back. Well, of course, then, of course, I thought I'd arrived. I thought I was Somerset Mom and Charles Dickens rolled into one. And I said, well, isn't that wonderful? I mean, I'm a writer by accident. What on earth would I do if I start writing on purpose? Thank goodness I didn't throw up my good job, you know, 15 pounds a week teaching in the school. Uh, because, uh, in fact, for the next four or five years, I never got anything published at all. Because I didn't realise then, which I realise now, that I, the reason that that article had been published, you know, why people had published it, was, it was, it was written in my own voice. I was writing to my mother and father. I wasn't trying to impress them. I wasn't using long, complicated words. I didn't hone and polish each sentence and wonder would that sentence be better than the other sentence. I just wrote the way I speak. And I speak quickly without much pause for breath. And I write quickly without much pause for, for punctuation. And I think we're better to write the way we speak. And so when I ever am asked to give advice to people about writing, I go to great trouble to try and recreate that piece of advice for them because it was such a helpful thing to write about what you really know about instead of trying to be pretentious. Every time I look around Dorking, I think to myself, that I must be fairly unusual for a writer because I had a very happy childhood. And usually writers are meant to have tortured childhoods and that they write to escape from it all or they write because they say, I'll show them. I'll show the people who were awful and rotten to me when I was young. But in fact, I had a very pampered childhood. I grew up here in Dorky, a place it may be said that I didn't think was a gorgeous place at all. I didn't see that it was one of the most lovely things in the world to be living 10 miles from the capital city and on the sea and in nice peaceful surroundings. I thought this place was very dull because it wasn't the center of the universe. And I thought the beating heart of the universe was Dublin. And I wished that there was something that could make us go and live in a, in a house on the side of the street with traffic roaring up and down and adventure everywhere. But it was a very happy childhood. My father was a very quiet man. He was a barrister, William Lynchy was his name. And my mother was uh, a nurse, uh, Maureen Blackmore was her name. She was a great, big, handsome woman, and she was the best of fun. And they were very different people. You often look back, I suppose, a lot of people look back on their youth and wonder what did my mother and father see in each other. And it was a very happy home. Uh, I was the eldest of about three and a half years, so I was three and a half before my sister came along. And I remember that my first memory is kneeling down by my bed and praying please God send me uh, a little brother or a little sister. And you know, I was begging for it so much that it seemed to be like very good news. And I was bitterly disappointed when a red-faced baby arrived and I was taking some of the attention off me. And I said to my parents, apparently after about six months, you know, uh, she Joan's grand, she's fine, but I think I'd prefer a rabbit. Is there any way we could send her back and have a rabbit instead? When I went to school, I went to the Holy Child Convent in Killiney. They were English nuns who came to teach in, uh, in Ireland in the 1940s. So by the time I was ready to go to school there, I, I suppose it must have been the late 40s when we, when we started, they were established. They were the nicest nuns that you ever came across in your life. I think they regarded coming to Ireland as part of their missionary duty. You know, I mean, they were either sent to the Gold Coast or to Era. It'd be hard to know which would be the most frightening for them. They were the most decent, good, hard-working nuns. And of course, naturally at the time, I didn't think that. Naturally, I thought, you know, they had rules and sciences here for no reason and sciences there. But they were great. And we went to school every day from Dorking to Killiney. 
It's one of the most beautiful train rides in the world. You come, you used to get on the train and go off the station on travel. There were no five minutes then. And we travelled along a little seaside route. It's the kind of a place now that the Irish church wanted to be inviting people and urging them to go on. It was the kind of place that I'd want to go on myself if I was in Italy or Greece. And I'd say, isn't this a fantastic view? But in those days, I never saw, I never looked out the windows when we got to the tunnel and saw the beautiful sea below. I never saw the cliffs. I never saw the whole sheet of Kalani Bay. Because I wasn't much more interested in school. And if you had your, your arithmetic homework done, and if you know your, knew your poem in Irish off by heart, or if you had a crush on the games teacher, or if your best friend wasn't treating to you, those were things I seem to remember for the 10 years when we to and from that school. I loved watching them between the Larry Crossing Road. It was a story about a, a lot of people who went home for the weekend, back home to their own village somewhere in the country, and they worked in Dublin during the week. And they went home in a, in a nice, uh, brightly coloured bus, which I called the Lalic bus. And it was a great difference for them to see the bus bouncing along the road. I really got a great surge of pride thinking I invented that out of my, my own head, and there suddenly was a the whole film team filming it. Well, the pendulum didn't tell me. There is a little place. Where do I get a cross-off location of me? Where do you put me in a mouth? I had a pendulum in a bit the great thing about living and growing up in a village, so often, even though it's a suburb in many ways, is a village, there's a village at atmosphere about it, is that you meet everybody every day. You meet old people and young people. You don't just meet a whole your own one set of friends. It's terribly easy to write about a village. Because it, if you're writing about a village, you don't have to think of a whole complex series of excuses as to why uh, Mary met John and why either of them met somebody else. Once they leave their door, they're going to meet everybody in the village. And so I always set my book in villages. <laughs> writing about young people and children. There's something that everybody understands me, because everybody was young once. I mean, however old they are now, they must remember something about being young. And I think very often that there's a great similarity amongst children all over the world. We all go through the same embarrassments and hopes and dreams. And there isn't a child in the world that hasn't had a dream sometimes. When I wrote the book Circle of Friends, I wrote that really mainly about myself, not about my nice Tam, Phil, Stanley and Dorothy, but about a different kind of a girl, a girl called Benny. So I had a, a big square girl, and I was a big square girl when I was young, I'm still a big square girl. But she had a dream, like I had, at the age of 10, of getting a really gorgeous shot. She'd been to a pantomime in Dublin, and she thought that maybe for her 10th birthday, her mother was going to get her a shot. So I'll read that book here, and then I'll tell you how it is exactly the same in my own case, only worse. <laughs> so it's Benny's 10th birthday. My mother comes home. Her mother said, Tell me, did you have a nice day at school? Did they make a fuss of you? They did, mother. Well, that's good, and they won't know you when they see you this afternoon. Then his heart soared. Well, I'd be getting dressed like in anything new before the party, she said. Oh, I think so, said mother. You'll have you looking like the bee's knees before they come in. Uh, would I put it on now? Why not? Then his mother seemed excited about seeing the new outfit herself. I'll lay it out the above. Come up now and give yourself a bit of wash and we'll put it on. Then he stood patiently in the big bathroom while the back of her neck was washed. It wouldn't be long now. Then she was led into the bedroom. Close your eyes, said Mother. When Benny opened them, she saw on the bed a thick navy skirt, a fair eyed jumper in navy and red, a big, sturdy pair of navy shoes sat in the box, and chunky white socks folded nice and neatly beside them. Peeping out of tissue paper was a small red shoulder bag. It's an entire outfit, cried Mother. 
You're going to be dressed from head to foot by Peggy Pine's shop. Mother stood back to see the effect of the gift. Then he was worthy. No velvet dress. No lovely, soft, crushed velvet that she could throw with its beautiful lacy skin. Only horrible, harsh, rough things like horses' hair. Nothing in mystery pink, but instead good, plain, sensible colours. And the shoes. They were the pants of the pants of toes. Betty bit her lips, and she rolled the tears back into her eyes. Well, well, what do you think? Her mother was beaming proudly. Your father says you must have the handbag and the shoes as well. It would make it a real outfit, he said. He said that going into double figures must be marked. It's lovely, Benny nodded. And isn't the jumper perfect? I've been asking Peggy Pine to get something like that for ages. I said I didn't want anything shabby. I wanted something that would stand up to a bit of rough and tumble. Oh, it's so gorgeous, Benny said. She her mother else. But she didn't want to. Not why she still had the velvet shoe in her mind. I, I put on myself, Mother, then I'll come and show you, she said. So did Benny got off to bed, and she went over the mirror on the wardrobe to see if her face looked as red and tear-stained as she feared. She saw the chunky figure of a child in a vest and knickers, neck red from scrubbing, eyes red from weeping. She was not a person that anyone would ever dream of sitting in a pink velvet dress and little pants with pointed toes. Well, it wasn't hard to write that because that happened to me when I was 10. Except there's another bit I didn't put in the book, which is almost too sad, because I remember my mother saying to me, and you know the great thing about it, Mary, she said, it'll never wear out. And the only hope I had was that it might be worn out soon. I would never really write a children's book. It was rejected to me, but I think I should stay 100 miles away from a children's book because the children would spot me for what I am. I'm trying to improve them. I've uh, been a teacher for eight years of my life, and I think it's once a teacher, always a teacher. If ever I see a, a young child, I'm always trying to get him or her to do more. I have a nephew now, I always want him to be learning this and learning that. And, uh, uh, you, you know, it, it, it shows. Well, now, my two uh, children's writer, Gordon, uh, writes children's books, and he never has this problem at all. Because the children in his books are often, you know, usually break the laws of the school. The teachers are all awful. And uh, the children get away with murder. It's an extraordinary thing to have your books translated into different languages. I only speak one other language than English. I can speak French. So I'm able to read my books in French. And I think they're terrific in French. I think I write better in French, actually, than I do in English. But I don't, I'm not able to read them in the other languages. And even I'm not able to understand the letters in some of the languages because they've been translated into Greek and to Hebrew. And in Hebrew, they start at the back of the book. And I wouldn't know it was my book except I see my round face looking out in the author photograph. And they've been translated into Finnish. And uh, I think it's seven languages, like Korean this year. They're going to be translated into Korean, which is great. Now, there's a bit of me that says, uh, what in the name of the law do these people in far countries want to be reading about us for and, and the kind of life that I lived in the 50s. But I suppose if the people are real, in a sense, if they can get the mood of the people being real, it doesn't really matter where it's set. It is a great thrill to see your book in a, in a foreign language. When I was in Sweden and I saw it in Swedish uh, at the airport, I must say I thought that was great. And I did see a man passing by it and I had a terrible urge to <laughs> rush up to him and say, bring that home now, your family would love it. In a sense, that's the thing I'm most proud of, is to be able to try and capture the memories of childhood. Because I can remember it. Maybe I never really grew up, but I can remember exactly what it was like to be a child. I remember what it was like to be embarrassed and always in the wrong. And I can remember the feelings of, of, of youth and the feelings of frustration that I was never going to be able to escape and see the whole world. And in a way, I think that not having children has been a help to me to write about children. I would like to have had children. And I think, just like everybody thinks, that I'd have been a terrific mother. I might have been a demon mother because I'd have been so bossy. But because I don't have children myself, I suppose I can relate to them better. And also, uh, I was a teacher for eight years. And as a teacher, you see the best of children. You really do very often see the best of children. 
and you see the lively, idealistic side of them that their parents often don't see at all. And I used to love girls at the age when their mothers and fathers were very tired of them, you know, between sort of 13 and 15. I used to think girls were terrific at that age. Of course they were moody and sulky and kicking things, and of course they were misunderstood, but they were also they were also full of dreams and hopes, and they were in, started to become interested in poetry, and they were interested in saving the world much more than their parents were, who were meant to be these responsible people. And I could see from the, behind the desk in the classroom at school, I could see when things weren't going well for them, and when maybe their friends had fought with them, or maybe their schoolwork wasn't going well. I would know a home where there weren't many books for the children to be encouraged. I could see all that. But not, not because that was so brilliant. Any teacher could see that. Whereas the mother and father could often just see a child wanting to play music too loud, wanting not to study, wanting to be out all the time, refusing to tidy a room. They saw all the negative sides. Whereas our, uh, we teachers often saw the best of them. And I, I love writing about the classroom. And when I'm encouraging young people to write, I encourage them to write about their school days also. Because that's the bit that they're experts in. That's not written. A packet of crisps, please. You haven't got any. Bad for you, anyway. It's far from a knife. And there's other bit of that that I liked very much, too, which was a scene between Celia and her mother in the pub. And I, this came very much from the heart because I know how we all love our parents. I won't allow anybody else to say a bad word about them. We can criticise them ourselves, but we won't let anybody else criticise them. So in this book, I had Celia, have a, 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 who was the daughter of the pub, and her mother was a widow, ran the pub, and was an alcoholic. And when she came home every weekend, she used to find her mother drunk in the pub and behaving badly. And her sense of shame after her hard week's work in, in Dublin, and she'd come into the pub and see the mother drunkenly falling around the place, and she tried to put a good face on it. I thought that was brilliantly done by Dad McCarroll in the film. Hey, stop, 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 one singer, one stop, right? I am dead. I am dead. No man enjoying himself. Well, don't talk rubbish. It's a good job there isn't another kid in that scene. Only Bart had tells when I'm aware. God knows what would happen. Hey, it's a big help to you, I'm sure. Oh. It's a funny thing when your books are made into films, because the different uh, worlds entirely. I'm not uh, able to write a film script. Not yet. I might try one day, but I haven't been able to write one yet, because I write big, long long explanations of thoughts that are going on in people's minds and I'm not good at writing a short, snappy uh, dialogue that a film wants. But I've been very pleased with, it, with my books that have been made into films and our television series. <laughs> country music coming our way at midday, but now discussing philosophy looks back at the dawn of the modern age and Descartes. So that 
start to listen to any, the people can walk out of any Brown's house at any stage today, you know. They can walk out and almost take the song that Annie has sung for them and wrap it around them like a shawl. You know, they can wear the scene like a shawl. So they can go out into the bleak wind and the bitter wind and the narrow wind, like, and flourish because they are in the, they have the great protection and the comfort of any scene, you know. Um, so they rushing through a mill race. Above this water mill, it's a trout river, one of the most famous in the world. Below, it's a fine salmon river. From the mill, it flows past Broadlands, the home of Lord Mountbatten. For five and a half miles, the river flows through the meadows of the Broadlands estate, which owns the fishing rights. The broadland stretch of the river finishes at the motorway. From there, the Tess runs on down to Southampton Water, about three miles away. This documentary follows the life of the man who looks after the broadland section. It's a film of one year in his life. Bernard Aldridge is the river keeper for Lord Mountbatten. Every day when he arrives in his fishing hut, he looks to see what's in the dive. This is a special day, February the 17th, 1978, the first day of the salmon fishing. Not that it's likely there will be fish in the river till April. There used to be fish in the river in winter. Bernard caught his personal record fish, a 33-pound salmon, in January. Bernard knew, without looking in the diary, that there would be only one fisherman out that day. Brigadier Ty Wood, who ritualistically fished on the first possible day for the love of it, though he knew there was nothing to catch. Sadly, it was his last February the 17th. He died later in the year. Though the main river is a salmon river, Bernard also has a trout stream, which he stocks with trout he rears. There is insurance. If the salmon fails, he can always change over completely to trout. Each winter, he writes the diary of the previous season. Every salmon that's caught is entered in the main diary. Bernard becomes a register of death, recording for posterity everything about each salmon. Its weight, sex, condition, where it died and how it was caught and the time. He's writing out the records of the fishing season we've just seen starting in the snow of February 78. And he's also writing a report looking back over the past year. Well, this year started off with a roar, really. We really thought we were going to have a record season. The fish, we caught our first fish on the 8th of April, and they were all jolly good fish, all double-figure fish. These were a return of our spring run, which had been declining over the last 10 years and almost faded away to nothing. We went on like this right through until about the end of June, when we would normally expect our small fish, these are the grill, uh, the maiden one year old, in the, one year in the sea fish, and the summer fish, which are our sort of eight to ten pound fish, we would have expected those to start building up until we would be killing, say, a hundred in July, a hundred in August, hundred in September. This just didn't happen. They just did not come. So we finished up at the, at the end of the season with a, another very, very mediocre year.
Early in March 1978, the whole season was still a mystery in the future. Oh, hello, sir. Any signs yeah. of life? No signs of life at the moment. No. That wind's a bit of a devil, isn't it? Yeah. And I'm afraid the river's coming up and colouring a bit. Due to all that rain and nasty we had last night. Yeah. Well, there must be a fish or two creeping up, you know. If they've had fish below us. Well, it's always the next one hoped for. Bernard's life divides into endless speculations about the mysterious wayward salmon and guaranteeing there'll be trout to catch. These trout he's reared from eggs. They'll stay in the nursery for a few more months, but it'll be 18 months before they're ready to be fished. On the 3rd of April, his daughter Mary flew back from Australia. She'd been away nearly three years. <laughs> the Aldridges have two daughters, Jill, who works as a secretary, and Mary, a nurse. Neither of them was destined for a country childhood, but then Bernard didn't plan it either. I was living in London. I was married and two children, and times were fairly hard. Um, we weren't earning a great deal of money, and my sister married a rumsey boy. And they invited us down here for a holiday, and we all came down for a holiday, and his parents were also looking after my predecessor, Walter Geary, and he was a marvellous character, and I used to come down the river and potter about with him, and we became great friends, and I loved the place, of course, loved the open air life, loved his way, and quite out of the blue, actually, um, Walter was getting on in years, he was 64 or 5 then, and uh, he had no replacement, there was no one to take his place at all, and he quite out of the blue asked me would I like to take the job, and of course I did, and um, I duly had an interview and was accepted, and we haven't looked back since. I've seen my children grow up with roses in their cheeks. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Nice to be home. Oh, <laughs> oh too much. <laughs> yeah, got them in the bag. Oh, oh look at Oh, cheers. Got my hands shaking. We brought him to the toilet. I'll be right now. Have a stick. Lovely to see you. Yeah, well, 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 well. There was absolutely nothing in Bernard's life which could have predicted what he'd become. I was born in Woolwich. South East London, and um, my father was at sea. Uh, my mother died when I was about uh, seven, and um, or as young as five. I went to school right opposite where we lived, and then I went uh, from there to walk to uh, a central school and then a polytechnic. And of course, the war came along, and uh, at the age of thirteen, I left. Polytechnic and went to a training ship, the Indefatigable, 
she was originally birthed in the Mersey and then she went up and moved to a shore establishment because of the war up in North Wales. And then I went to sea and I was on uh, troop ships, tankers, all sorts. Um, then I left the sea, joined the police force in London and stuck that for two and a half years. And then I went to the Royal Society of Medicine where we used to do all the medical films, rare operations, new techniques, and all that sort of stuff. And from there, I came here. A young man couldn't become a river keeper nowadays as casually as Bernard did. There's a course in river keeping at the Hampshire Agricultural College, and students are sent to Bernard for training. What we've got to do is put this wire round on the bottom of this post here is a crook. It's an iron loop. Right, and then we put that over there, hopefully. Right, got it. And we can throw the whole thing down and winch it down. Okay. Bernard has three regular assistants who work full time on the river with him. This is not a fishing net, it's designed to catch waterweed that drifts down the river and makes fishing difficult. Right, now if we tighten up these winches, we'll draw this right down. The successful river keeper has a mixture of talents. Part of the time he's leading a cold, wet, heavy physical life, and then he immediately changes to be an expert on the art of fishing or a man tough enough to stand up to poachers. April the 28th, 1978. Cold, pouring with rain, and it's time to start stocking the trout stream. These are two-year-old trout, average weight two and a half pounds. Bernard rears 4,000 a year in his stews. Some are sold direct as trout to the table, the rest go into the trout stream. Fishermen will pay £230 a year. This will give two people a day's trout fishing a week, but they mustn't catch more than eight fish a day. Put a big one in. Well spaced out and carefully placed near cozy. Dug out from an old ditch, and then the waters of the test fed through it. It was cunningly designed by Bernard. It's not easy to fish it, and it takes skill to catch one of his trout. Just a little, just a little way down, Graham. We'll put some more in just down by the trees. Fishing has changed. Nowadays, most trout rivers in England are stocked like this. There are few areas where you can fish for wild brown trout. Fishermen pay to fish, but they want to know there are good trout there. In return, they're prepared to pay more for their fishing. And we're going down. The river keeper used to be a guide to fishermen and a protector of fish. Now he farms the river as well. a marvellous history. This book goes back to 1881 when the salmon fishing first started. They employed a, the first keeper on our piece of the test was a chap named John Cragg. And really there's very little said about Cragg but he must have been a marvellous character. There are photographs of him in existence and he seemed a, a great big burly sort of chap he used to wear the old square short stovepipe hat. I think it's largely due to him cleaning up the river of poachers. He was the scourge of all the poachers in, in Rumsey. 
and he cleaned up the whole river and got it all operating as a salmon river. So there is a great deal owing to this man. Ever since they came to Broadlands, they've lived in an estate house some way from the river. Bernard gets an average wage, but he's absolutely tied to his job. Even at night, he makes unexpected visits, patrolling for poachers. And he's usually there from dawn, preparing and observing. He wants to know where the salmon are before the fishermen arrive. During the day, he hardly takes any time off. He nips home for meals and back down again as quickly as he can. It's the end of May and everybody has been astonished at the numbers the fish caught. There are two figure fish weighing 10 pounds and over. It always used to be like this, a spring run of good fish, but it has faded away. There's a feeling of success about, because although Bernard can't be blamed if there are no fish, it makes him very cheerful if there are. Yeah. Nearly all the fishermen come here first, just for a chat. Uh, because you can fill them in as to flies that or baits that we are catching the fish on yesterday um, water temperatures they ask your opinion and 20 odd years on a, on a water you you get to know quite a little bit about the water don't know all about it um, you get to know where the fish are lying in pools. Sometimes fish lie up at the head of pools, middle of pools, they lie at diff different depths, again, mostly due to the water temperature. And these are the things that you help the fishermen, you help the fishermen with. And of course fishermen send guests who may never have fished the water. So we go up there with them and we point out exactly the pools. And we visit them during the day, we're up and down all day, just talking and, and um, helping them in any possible way we can. Hello then. Hello. Haven't seen you for a long, long time. Yeah. How's it going? Well, I'll pull this out before I get it in the way. Yeah. Very well. Any signs of life? Well, I got the one salmon at 11 o'clock. At 11? What, on a prawn? On a prawn, yeah. The same as I've got here. They're all wrapped Marvelous. up in elastic. Yeah. Marvellous. Where is he? In the car? He's in the car, yeah. Let's have a look. This is the most glorious day. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Good hatch of mayfly. Yeah. Just starting. Very good. That's a, that's that's a, that's a, turn the other way. Oh, yes, that's a nice fish. That's a beauty. Been declared Britain's largest and most beautiful national park. Over the next six weeks, I'm going to take Norman Nicholson's advice. I'm going to take a journey on foot from the centre of the national park to the shores of the Irish Sea, where I'm lucky enough to live. I hope to show you the many moods of the area and the varying views of the people who live and work in the National Park as well as those who come here for recreation and enjoyment. Why don't you join me? Down on the shore, I met Jerry Wilson, the youth and schools officer of the National Park. Surely, if anyone could tell me about the running of the park, it was him. You're based at the National Park Centre at Brockhole, so you're really the ideal man to tell me all about National Parks. The first question I need to ask you, really, is why do we need National Parks? Well, there's a lot of nice country 
uh, countryside in England and Wales, but the ten national parks are something special. Um, countryside that I think uh, for generations people have enjoyed before they were designated as, as national parks. People used to go to Dartmoor, Exmoor, people used to go to Snowdonia, and here the Lake District, um, John Ruskin, famous mountain artist, fresh from touring European mountain areas, came and sat quite close to where we're sitting now and said, this is the third most beautiful view in Europe. I mean, this means it's something really special. Well, I could agree with him, but the thing that strikes me, if people were coming anyway, why did we need a, a national park? Because um, it had got to the stage when obviously things were, were being overrun. Um, people were beginning to um, create pressures of traffic um, and um, at honeypots, um, the, the popular attractions, people were coming, people were beginning to wear it away. The, the Lake District was, was in danger of being loved to death. But surely, I mean, if you've got a national park, you're saying, come in and see our national park, you're increasing the problem. Yes, but that's not what we say. <laughs> this is the job for the Cumbria Tourist Board. Um, it's our job to make sure that those who come here um, are able to enjoy it in as natural a way as possible. We have to preserve and enhance the natural beauty of this national park. We have to promote people's enjoyment of it and then not lose sight of the fact that um, people were here before national parks working and earning a living. And so we haven't to, uh, to forget them. Well, I mean, this is a good point, isn't it? People do live and work here, and the word park suggests it's only for recreation. That must give you problems from people saying, well, it's to play in. Yes, and uh, this is, is one of our major jobs as uh, a visitor service, and why at the National Park Centre at Brockhoe, and all the information centres in most of the major villages and towns in the National Park, uh, we have to try and um, explain to, to people visiting this national park exactly who owns it and what their rights are here, uh, what they can do, what they can enjoy freely and where they have to be careful to blend in with, with the local needs. Well, people our age, of course, uh, we have had to be taught, but it strikes me going to Brockhole that um, you get a lot of visits from schools, for instance, and mm. youngsters who are being educated from the word go. Is that going to make a difference in the long term? Well, this is my hope for the, the future, that uh, the young people growing up now are growing up with much more environmental awareness. Uh, they're growing up with conservation, whereas it came to us, you know, fairly late in life, really. And uh, so you're even now getting it in the new GCSE uh, syllabuses, um, studies of national parks and the issues and the problems that are found here. Well, Jerry, I could sit here all day because, by golly, I agree with Ruskin. It really is the most marvellous place, isn't it? But I've got a long way to go, and I think I'd better head into the hills, really. So, alas, we must bring this to an end and set on our way. Hmm, right. But you know, Tony, if you're going to be going right through the, the central fells, um, you're not going to half get wet and cold and miserable or dressed like that. And uh, as for those trainers <laughs> there, I mean, they're a joke, aren't they? Uh, I thought you might say something like well, that. Actually. I don't know whether you know this, but the majority of accidents aren't to the old hairy rock climbers. They're to people slipping. Just a simple slip is the biggest cause of mountain accidents in the fells. So you really do need something with uh, a bit more grip. Well, everybody seems to have trainers on these days, don't they? Especially yeah. on days like this. Yeah. But it's all right walking around down by the lake here, but uh, once you get up into serious mountain terrain where you're in amongst boulder scree and uh, um, slippy, lichenous covered uh, rocks, then, you know, it's a different ball game altogether. Yeah, yeah. That applies really to my jeans as well, doesn't it? Well, in wet weather, in, in wet weather jeans um, are worse than youth useless. Try and experiment and put a bit of jeans material over your hand, wet it and just blow. <laughs> and the evaporation, evaporation causes very, very yeah. quick cooling effect on the back of the hand, and, uh, and so useless. Well, I'll let you into a secret, Jerry. I, in fact, I've got my old faithful boots in my pack here. Um, my pack's seen better days, so I'm going to see if I get a new one of those. I'm going to George Fisher's shop, actually. I'm going to spend a bit of my hard-earned money to get kitted out a wee bit better. Couldn't go to a better place, yes. <laughs> <laughs> the whole essence of Lakeland is its ever-changing moods. One minute showing a sunny, smiling face, the next a misty landscape fraught with danger. By the time I'd left Jerry Wilson and reached the centre of Keswick, the glorious sunny day had given way to cloud and mist.
Dublin number 706 8241. 706 8241. Doctor, thank you. Thank you. Selma. The last word to me, Doctor. Mm. So why settle for anything less? Duracell. No ordinary battery looks like it or lasts like it. Break. Why not enjoy one? Same. And also down the side, there's a shadow down there and of course down the side of the down the side of the wall. Never worry too much about exact colours, uh, as long as it looks right in your picture, because it's the painting you're doing, uh, and your painting has got to stand up by itself after it's taken away from the scene. And as long as everything is fine in, and matches up in your painting, that's really what we're going for. We're going for an impression of the scene. Notice I'm not working very thick with the oil paint. A lot of people think that with oil paint you've got to, you know, with all the mixing and all the thickness of paint, but we don't really need that. We can build up to that if we want. Or, of course, you can paint like that if you like and jump around and, and be all excited and, and really extravagant. You don't need clothes like this. You need a big top on to, uh, to work like that. When you're outside, or, or even working inside, I, I work the same. I, I work quite thinly to start with, and then gradually build up the paint as I go on. And usually the uh, way that I work is dark, working dark first. Not all the time, but I work dark tones first, uh, and then bring the lighter ones up. And the lighter tones are the ones that I usually get lighter, um, thicker thicker paint, use thicker paint for the lighter tones. Of course you can easily get lost working on areas like this which are very similar, they're different areas of green. But you've, there's nothing you can do about it apart from try and make, look at areas and think, ah, that's the one, that's the big tree with the shadow on it or whatever and use that as a sort of guide as you're working through a long expanse like I'm doing now. now some of these trees go further up the houses um, and the reason that I didn't put them right up was because I can now drag the paint onto the wet paint and just merge it in a bit more as the tree climbs up the house or in front of the house. So I've added white to it, to our colour, just to bring out the shape of the tree. There's another one there, but I've made this a bit yellower because they, they all change colour. Or, or when I say they all change colour, they're all sort of different colours. Every tree is different. And in fact, even if you looked at every leaf on a tree, I'm sure it won't be exactly the same colour. And although this is very subtle, it's very important when you're painting a picture, whether it be watercolour or oil, um, to make sure that you do change colours uh, and although you, you're changing them in a very subtle way a painting is made up of subtleties when we're working and so a little subtle colour here and there makes all the difference It's amazing how quick the tide comes up uh, in an, an area like this. And within, it seems almost within the last quarter of an hour or so, the tide's actually come up behind me. In fact, oh, it's amazing. There's a load of fish down there. Yes, I think they're mullet. And um, it's amazing what you see when you're out painting, isn't it? That's one of the nice things of painting because you always still remember. You're not rushing around. It isn't a a hobby where you're rushing around, you're still, and nature actually carries on around you. And when you're in the fields, I've had little mice that have run around the side of me, and in fact, you won't believe this, I've had a spider that's actually gone from this corner of the uh, 
this lid and made a web right the way across and then walked across. I've actually seen that happen while I've been working. It's amazing what happens when you're out with nature. Um, now, where I forgot where we were. Where were we? Uh, ah, yes, these boats. So we've got that one, we've got that one, that one. Now, that one will be light on the back, so we'll leave that one. I, in fact, there aren't, the, the boats now are actually floating rather than beached, and they've moved around, and, and this one has gone uh, in front of that one, so I can't see what colour it was, but I'm sure it was a white one. This was white or a grey, so I'm going to leave that. That will be in light. Um, now, I don't think, apart from putting a dark, more dark on the, on the uh, hull, I don't think there's any more we need at this point to put on the yacht. There's this one, of course, but I'll leave this one um, while I, until I put all this um, mud on. So let's get the mud on there. Notice I'm not trying to paint exactly around the boats. It's all being done quite freely. I'm just dragging the paint over. Now there's a nice light bit through there. I think that's water. Th this dark, incidentally, which I just put on before I started to paint this, I forgot to tell you about that, uh, is that is water. And the strange thing is, uh, it's darker, the water is darker than the, the mud banks um, or the mud bottom and that's because of the reflections you've got tremendous reflections of all the trees that are coming into the estuary and that's why the water is darker which is quite surprising because one imagines that water is light or reflecting the blue sky and this mud here was sort of a bluey pink where it was still wet where the water had been running down from just up here when the tide went out. There was a reflection of that boat uh, in the water here so I, I'll more than likely put that in and now it went a yellowy colour over here. This was a bank that came down, or still is, except it isn't there at the moment. We can't see it because the tide's up. And I, I again, I'm doing this dry. This is water here. In fact, it went quite mauve near the water's edge, where it was leaving it wet. So I must put that in, just run it into the water just a little bit there and down here and this is all dry brush. Now I'll be telling you more about dry brush in another program but what it does, it, it leaves this lovely dryness underneath, uh, hit and miss, this is what it, do, it, it does, it hits the canvas or the paper and misses it and you get this lovely feeling of movement and happenings. It's a funny word, isn't it? Happening. Still, it sounds good. It's exactly what happens. Happening. It is happening on the canvas. Now, it's rather strange because that, that, um, the left-hand side of the boat, which should be in shadow, has actually got the sun. And it's it's all light down there and yet we've got the shadow around there obviously the sun is very high and it's coming down and catching it which is rather good because it leaves us with this lovely light edge against all this dark side of the key I just spent a few minutes looking at this um, because you've always got to do that. You can't stay over the painting all the time. You've got to get back and look with a, a fresh eye, even if it's only five minutes, and have a look at it again, and you see things 
that either you want to alter or that you're very pleased with, or you just want to adjust a little bit. Well, I've had a look, and I'm going to now carry on with the houses under here. Remember I said I was going to leave these till later? Well, I think the time has come now to put them in and kill this really harsh white light. It's just a, 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 a white with a little bit of crimson in and yellow that um, I'm using. Under this tree, where it's very important because of the light against dark under there. Now, can you see, look at that. Can you see how that tree trunk comes out? That really comes out, that tree trunk, and helps to stand it in front of the houses in the background. Now, and I'll more than likely put a bit more yellow light through there. That's a weeny, just could do with a little bit more yellow light through there. But in the meantime, I'll leave that. Oh, there's a roof there, and that roof is light, but not as light as the sides. So I've just added a little bit of grey that's on the palette because I've got different messy colours on the palette. In fact, I've got a spider walking over it now. Funny these things, aren't they? They're always, things are always around. Um, I think we'll just get a bit more light on these boats. On, oh, did you hear that fish? It's amazing, these fish. It really is. And I like fishing as well, and here I am. And there's nothing I can do about it. But then I like painting. Just as nice. So, a bit more light there, a bit more light on that. A bit more on that. Now, there's just a flick under there, just to give a bit of movement. There's one or two little things, uh, sort of semi-light areas. I don't know what they are. They're just, just if you look very carefully, you can see them. It just gives an edge to that, just helps. And this brush is what we call a rigger. But I'll be telling you more about that during the series. And it, it is a, a thin one. And it means that I can get a nice thin line. You stop breathing when you do that. If you breathe, you're going to... Ooh, shake like that it will shake all your hands so when you're doing a straight line or something that you, you want to keep absolutely still don't breathe and you'll be able to manage and don't think about anything else just think about the line that you're doing got another one down here Isn't it lovely when I don't talk anyway here we go let's carry on There, one on this one. Over there. Now, they've all got rigging on. That one. Got that bit along there. Again, I'm not sure what to call it. It's a little bit sticking off up there. And now, it's amazing how these, this rigging is in light colour. Just let it hit and miss as it comes down. In fact, hit and miss, you, you've got to do it so sort of gently that some cases it won't hit the paper but that doesn't matter because you're just go back and do it again it's better than getting it too heavy there we are that's all we need just this gentle little touch now a few highlights on the the yacht now that's the where the sun is just catching the top of this blue whatever it is um, round the side I think we could have 
bit of light. There's a little patch of light just, just up there. Oh, and I know what there is. There's the... These sails, which are blue, just over there like that. Might be a little bit bright, but I don't know. No, I don't know. It doesn't worry me. Um, could do with a little bit of dark on the on the mast, just down further down. I'll show you where. Just a little bit. It's what we're doing now. It, it's all the little bits that sort of make the painting and pull it all together. A little little bit of dark down there. That's it. Just a little bit. Another line that goes through there. And all these little bits do help to pull it all together and give it life. Um, yes, there's a little bit of light on there. Now, I, I've no idea really what all these little bits are because it's impossible to tell. There was a, a yacht mast that went through in the background there. So all I can do is to just see them and just put them in. I don't know that I want that line there. I th I, I'm going to take, take that away in a little while. But in the meantime, I just want to put a few little bits of light on all these boats. That's the boat with the cover on it. bit more on that one. This, the brush is just starting to dance around a bit. I'm going back to there in a minute. I just want these little bits. We've got some lovely light that is on that one. And never mind about the fact that the scene changes, because the scene does change in front of you. Remember, the tide has come in since I've been doing this. Um, I am not. on your tray. 
You wouldn't like to sit on the tray yourself. Yeah, but none of your cheek. You go and attend to your work. Oh, yes, I have to do all the work. But they can go on enjoying themselves. Well, isn't it good to see a little bit of fun and jollity in the place again? <laughs> ready for the musicians. Sure, of course. Sure, I have two half battles of four for him. Now, ladies and gentlemen, while the musicians have a rest, Cousin Eliza, accompanied by Michael Sullivan, our village fiddler, will play a waltz for us. Say, it's a bother's that Mickey Sullivan in there with all the quality. Yes, oh, so it is. I'd better go and attend to the porter. for yourself is often about the little things. Now Carefree has added natural aloe vera to the new Carefree Aloe. Gentleness you can feel. Like all the little things you do for your body, it might not be visible, but it shows. New Carefree Aloe. to meet Joy Clarkson, who's called in the Cash in the Attic team to help her make a good first impression. Well, just one look at this tidy semi and you can tell the owner is someone who likes to keep their house in order. The garden is meticulously cared for and full of delightful detail. And the lady behind it all, Joy Clarkson, moved here from a larger house not so long ago to be closer to her daughter, Helen. Although she's done a lot of work to the house, she's asked us to help with one large finishing touch. Morning, ladies. Morning. Hello. How are you? Fine. Good. Yes. Yes. Good. Ready for a bit of a rummage and to clear out oh, there? Definitely. Definitely. Okay. definitely. So what sort of things are we going to be looking at, Joy, and where have they come from? Well, um, a lot of things are porcelain and china. I inherited them years ago, but having had a larger house before this, I really need to clear, you know. Right, well, if we find a selection of items to sell at auction, have you any idea in your mind the sort of money you'd like them to raise and what you want to spend it on? Well, I'm thinking about eight to nine hundred pounds. It's for a new front fence and outside lighting. Uh, just to make a, a good impression. OK, all right, so that sounds like a good idea to me. Now, who have we got on board today, then, with the rummage? I take it well, you Helen, are and Helen, Helen, yes. My son will be joining us later. Oh, OK, yes. all right, how old is he? 18. Is he? Mm. And he's um, under mother's orders here, is he? No, his choice. Really? Yeah. His choice. Well, that's very yeah. impressive yeah. at that yeah. age, I have to he's, say. He's, he's a great fan of his grand-grands, as he calls it, and spends quite a lot of time over here. He was here yesterday, mm. all around. Yeah, yeah he's so. a great character. Yeah. Right, OK, so we're looking at what, around £900? Yes. 
but your first impressions will be somewhat different at the front of your house. Yes. Yes, definitely. Right, no time to sit here and read the papers then. Let's go and have a good look at all the stuff you've got. Okay. With over 40 years of collecting behind her, Joy has amassed quite a treasure trove. And every room in her new home is jam-packed with interesting items. Wow, you've got a lovely house here. It's oh, really cosy, so. isn't it? Yeah. You've got some beautiful things as well, so we need to get going. But what we really need more than anything else at this moment in time is an expert. And I can hear your floorboards creeping upstairs, so I think that might give us a clue as to where he is. With an unbeatable eye for detail, Paul Hayes has been lifting the lid on the world of antiques for nearly 20 years. As our rummage begins today, he'll be using all his experience to cast his trained eye over Joy's precious pieces. Morning, Paul. Good morning. How are you? All right. Morning. Joy and her daughter Helen. Hello. It's Joy's are you? house, yeah. obviously. Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, some nice things. I've been had a good look round. Some lovely items, actually. Good. And what we got here are some cameos from the, what they call a grand tour. Have you heard of the grand tour? Mm -hmm. Well, the idea was that the gentlemen in, in the late 18th century would go out and they would visit places like ancient Rome and Greece, and they were so taken by the architecture and the marble statue to you that they, like, these items could be made out there and brought back like as souvenirs. So, uh, and you'd have all copies of famous sort of uh, Venus de Milo or any famous sort of uh, statues at the time, and you'd build up a complete collection. And uh, originally, they came in sort of um, book form. I have them. You have? I have. Oh, right. So did you mount them into this frame I here? did, yeah. Got you, because they're all numbered. If you have a look on yes, each one, 22, yeah, 40, yeah. and it say which, it which does, statue. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. Great if you've got that. Uh, but one, one or two I found already. I've got the, this one says um, La Terra, which is the, the surface of the earth. Mm -hmm. And this one says La Aqua, which is yes, the water. water. So it's like earth, fire, wind, mm -hmm. water sort of symbols. And then we've got all these wonderful classical sort of poses. Lots of them now you probably find in museums throughout the world, the original sort of marble mm -hmm. statuary. Uh, but they're made from plaster, a very, very thin plaster. And they're almost like making a, a biscuit. If you've ever used a, a biscuit mould, it's almost identical. You pour the plaster into the mould when it sets, you get these wonderful sort of relief mouldings. Uh, have you any idea what that might bring? No. That's no. auction. Oh, no, I thought idea. they were worth something, but I have not a clue. Well, as they are, I'll price them for a decorative appeal, just, just because they look like nice cameos. But if you've got the documentation that goes with them and you can relate each one... They're in here. Great stuff. Are they? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Right, All let's right. add a bit more cash to the pot, then. Yes. Here we go. Ah. Here we go. Now, the this then? Yes. Right. Yeah, this is lucky. Like they're a bit eaten, though, aren't they? Oh, yeah. look at that. Look oh, at the wow. <gasps> But look at the beautiful writing. Yeah, so what we've got it's here, and if you look at number 13 here, it says um, Pope oh. the Seventh, is it? Yes. Confortis, but that's what that's the name of the actual mm. intaglio, or the name yeah. of the cameo. So with a bit of work, the auction room would probably um, clean Decide these up and decipher some, of, some yeah. of them, yeah. So these are great, I mean, they must bring at least 100 to about 200 pounds. Really? Well, that's good. So you're happy for those to be sold, though? There's yes, no am, reservations yeah. about that? No, 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 no. No. We've had them long enough We've had in them every home. Yeah. 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 <coughs> the downsize? Yeah. OK, right, they're <laughs> off then. So, uh, so wait, let's find some more stuff. OK. <laughs> it's a stunning collection of intaglios, and items like these are extremely fashionable at the moment. But Joy is not tempted to keep them. We've had them for years, and uh, we've never known where these cameos came from. But they've always been a talking point, haven't yes. they? Wherever we've had them. Mm. Somebody else might appreciate them more. Definitely. So the intaglios will face the bidders at auction, with no regrets on Joy's part. £100 is a good start to our rummage, but there's no time to waste. While I polish off the silver in the hallway, Joy finds this collection of postcards of local landmarks from the early 20th century. Paul thinks they should fetch £30 to £50 at auction. After two finds, our total stands at £130, but we've still got a long way to go to reach the £900 Joy needs for her fence, so the hunt continues. Back in the hallway, Paul's been chipping away at the porcelain, and he thinks he's found something that should boost our total. Hello. Oh, you've got a piece as well? <laughs> <laughs> well there's quite a lot around the house, actually, isn't there? Yes, there is. Well, what we've got here are some Royal Worcester pieces, the best, really, in porcelain. And you've got quite a few examples. I've seen some nice little teacups and so on in there as well. But this vase in particular caught my eye. 
and it's uh, what they call blush ivory. Mm -hmm. And the way it's made, it's, it's made to look like an ivory piece, maybe with, with a amount of blusher on it. It gives that lovely sort of warm feel to it. The, the whole thing just, uh, just says warmth, really. It's beautifully done. Uh, now, th they employed some of the best artists and designers of the day. So if you were a famous um, watercolourist or a famous oil painter, chances are you could get a good job with Worcester and make a good living actually decorating the surfaces. Um, but the, the body itself is called Parian ware, and Parian's a very sort of warm, creamy sort of um, porcelain, and it gives a great sort of surface texture to put these wonderful designs mm -hmm. on. And they can date them. What we've got here is um, a crescent and the number 51. It says Royal Worcester. Now that means that when the factory was established, it was 1751, and the crescent mark was the first mark that was used. So it tells me it's Royal Worcester. But then also we have the wording around the edge, but we also have a, a series of dots. Can you see these little dots yeah. here? Hi. Uh, now, do you know what they are? Yes. That's right. <laughs> Each dot represents a year. That's right. And they start in 1891. Mm -hmm. And I've counted this one, it has 20 dots. So if we count from there, it means that this vase was made in 1911. Single vases are quite difficult sometimes, but you're looking at least 150 to about 200 pounds at sort of price band. Gosh. Uh, now, things always sell well in pairs. So a nice pair of vases like this, very stylish vases, will bring the same value, if not a bit more. So a nice pair like that, you're probably looking 200 to 250 mm -hmm. pounds. Mm -hmm. So how's Probably. that? Sounds marvellous. <laughs> Did you have any idea that that could possibly be Not there, really, Marianne? no. I, I mean, I thought they were worth something, but I had no idea of the right. uh, value of them. To get the best possible price for the Royal Worcester vases, Paul thinks this bunch of blushing beauties should go into the porcelain section of the sale, and Joy is tickled pink by his valuation. I do love the vases. I and associate them with my aunt very much and her family, but I think somebody else will appreciate them more. Well, the collection of Worcester is a real find, but we can't afford to rest on our laurels. As the search for more hidden treasure continues, up in the bedroom, Helen has been finding pots of potential in her mum's wardrobes. All her hard work throws up another piece of Worcester. This small vase, again in blush ivory, could fetch between 60 and 100 pounds in the porcelain section of the sale. That brings our total to 540 pounds. It's a cracking sum towards our 900 pound target for Joy's Fence. And in the bedroom, Helen thinks she's found something that might entice the bidders to spend some pennies. Paul, what about this cupboard? Oh, let's have a look. Oh, it's lovely, isn't it? Let's have a closer look. What's... Oh, is it a bedside table? Yeah, I think she's used it mainly for that. Ah. Yeah, it's been a drinks cabinet when Auntie had it. Well, this is actually called a pot cupboard or a night table. And the idea was it would sit next to your bed and it would store your potty for your night use. That was the idea. And it goes back to a time really before we had inside plumbing. It was very necessary if you needed the loo in the middle of the night. You couldn't go down the bottom of the garden. So you'd have to store it in one of these items. That was the idea. And this is a French one. And I know that because of its circular shape or tambour shape. Uh, here in Britain and in England in particular, when they made these items, they tended to be very square and angular. So the circular one dates to the early part of the 19th century and mainly a French sort of design. So that gives us a little indication of how old it is, really. Mm. And it has a, a marble top, which has been shaped for the top here. So the idea is that this would have other items which would contain water for washing and so on. And it was washable, it wouldn't ruin the actual mm. surface of, of the wood, if you like. And this is mahogany. It's a beautiful, rich, red, sort of uh, very vibrant colour, very close-knit wood, and very popular late 18th century, early 19th century. Uh, but but marvellous, that. So is this something that's quite sentimental? Is it something that you want to sell? I'm not sure about that. I'm still considering it. Right. And Helen likes it, so I think it's something we've got to talk about. Right. Well, the, the good thing is about it is it's a nice small piece of furniture, and it will go anywhere. So it'll go in the bedroom here, yeah. it can go in a large mansion, can go in my bed sit, whatever you want to put it. That's the whole idea. It's a small yeah. piece of furniture yeah. always sell particularly well. Yeah. Now, if I said that's worth between 70 and 150 pounds, I mean, does that tempt you in any way or? No? I don't <laughs> think so. All right. We might have to discuss that one. We might have to think about that. Well, that's fine. That's what it's all about. So yeah. you, you take your time. But yeah. let's go and find Lorne. It's a pretty little piece and could drive the bidders potty with its potential, but Joy is really unsure about sending it to auction. I think it's going to be hard to to make a decision on this pot cupboard. I like it very much. What it's about lovely, you? It's a lovely piece and it will be difficult to make that decision. It's your decision. 
I think we leave it until the day. Okay. So we'll have to wait until we get to the auction to find out if Joy will include the pot cupboard in her lots. One thing the bidders will be able to have a crack at is this Staffordshire tea service. It's made of bone china, which was first discovered and developed in the early 1800s by Josiah Spode. Although this particular tea service is neither that old or unusual, Paul thinks it should be served up to the bidders in the porcelain section of the sale, with an estimate of 60 to 80 pounds. Joining them there will be these fetching pickle dishes, which I find in the hallway. Another example of Staffordshire craftsmanship, this pair would look good in a country kitchen and would make a grand centrepiece for a ploughman's lunch with an estimate of 20 to 30 pounds. Our latest finds take our total to 690 pounds, including the pot cupboard. But if Joy decides not to take it to auction, it will affect our total. So we've really got to get searching and find some more treasures. And while Paul continues the hunt, I take the opportunity to find out more about Joy and her beautiful garden. Now, the garden looks lovely, but I understand you haven't been here this long. Fifteen weeks. Fifteen exactly. weeks. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about what it was like when you first moved to this house. We immediately had 15 trees cut down, which were enormous. You couldn't see the fence. So all this has just happened since I arrived, really. Well, you've been very busy, is all I can say to that <laughs> much. I've been in my house for 15 years and the garden's not like this, so <laughs> that's quite extraordinary. Are you a real garden lover, then? Oh, yes. I brought all the plants with me from uh, my nursery in Cheshire, and uh, they were shipped to Helen's garden and then to this garden. And Helen's garden still looks nice. We had far too many for here. <laughs> now, how many children have you? Well, I have two. Uh, Karen uh, died in 1988 of ovarian cancer, so that was hard for all of us, and I think brought us all very much closer together. Definitely, definitely. So she or old or younger? She sister? was older than me. She was nearly three years older than me. OK, so that must have been hard for you it as well. It was very difficult, very difficult, because we'd got closer as we got older, but Mum and I have... Our relationship has, has become much more solid since since that because it's something that does bring you together. Okay. And um, this, this garden here that you're, you're developing, I mean, obviously we can see the fence now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but we can also see the fence at the front of the garden, and I think you've got some plans for that. Yeah, definitely. It needs renewing so badly. I mean, it's just plastic mesh, really, and I want a wooden fence so that it's, you know, continue continuity all the way along the front. And who's this? <laughs> Scruffles. Hello, Scruffles. I think he's come to tell us it's time to go back and rummage. He's licking his lips like it's time for dinner, but we haven't got to that point yet. Come on, then, lead the way back in, then, Doglet. <laughs> Come on. While we've been chatting in the garden, Helen's son and Joy's grandson, Ben, has arrived. Under Paul's guidance, he's already got stuck into the rummage. And where do you find the blokes when the girls are having a chinwag? Where else but the garden shed? How about this? It's like an old lamp. Hey, hey, that's good, isn't it? Now then, now you're talking. So, so where's all this stuff come from? Is I believe it... this came from when she used to have the guest house. Her family friend was in the uh, Merchant Navy. All oh, right. Well, this is a lifeboat lamp. Oh. And what you would do, you would hang this you know, in, in the roof of your cabin. And because the waves would get very high, the whole thing would rock around. So that meant that the flame could stay alight and it wasn't going to tip out and be dangerous for anybody. And this wire work here, what that did is protect it. If it banged against the wall... So it wouldn't smash something. the glass? wouldn't smash the glass, isn't that great? Uh, but before electricity or before gas, everyone in the houses had paraffin lamps as well. So that's great, isn't it? I mean, this is like a, a height variant. See the little wheel there? Oh, yeah. And what you could do, you could move the wick up and down and that dips into your flammable liquid in the bottom here. All oh, right. And then it seeps up and soaks itself up, so when it lights, it keeps a constant light. It's very, very clever. And this is uh, what they call a through glass burner. So the, the idea is that air is drawn in through these little holes here, and that gives it its oxygen to, to, to sort of create the flame, and then the, the heat comes away from the top here. Isn't that marvellous, eh? So we've got a, a bit of lifeboat history by the looks of it here. This one looks like it could have come from the Grimsby lifeboat crew. And it's certainly about that time. This date's sort of um, 1900, 1910. So what we got, turn of the century, lifeboat lamp in good condition. Any idea what that might bring at auction? No idea. No idea? Uh, well, I think at least £30. Pounds. That's a good price. 
That sounds alright, doesn't it? Alright, well, I hope it um, makes a bit of a spark at the auction. Hey! hey. <laughs> right, come on. Well, that fascinating piece of maritime and local history is a real find. But does Ben think Joy will be happy to part with it? Well, to be honest, I've never seen her use the lamp, so I can't imagine she'll miss it that much. So let's hope it does well at auction. So the lamp is the ninth item we'll be packing off to auction, and our total now stands at £720. Back in the house, it's all hands on deck as the rummage continues. And upstairs in the bedroom, Helen uncovers some fine items with rare breeding. Oh, well, what have we got here? Hmm, not sure. Uh, are they Bezic? Uh, that one, I can't quite read that one. <laughs> Yeah, it says at the bottom here, Bezic, England. Well, they're a fast-growing collectible. They're one no, of these items that yeah. have only just started to be appreciated. And Bezic really were a, an ordinary tile manufacturer, ceramic manufacturer. But then in the 1930s, a guy called Arthur Gredrington, mm -hmm. he sort of made the first models. And apparently he used to go out into the field and he would study a particular animal mm -hmm. and he would take measurements of its muscle structure and so on. He'd make an original and then the cast moulds were then were cast from them. Uh, this one, quite unusual colour, nice sort of uh, bright colour. These are the more common ones, this sort of large... So you see quite a few of those around, don't you? Yeah, it's, this is what, what we call a drab brown colour, which is um, not so popular. It's the brighter colours that people yeah. tend to want. Yeah. So uh, the lovely the porcelain, fine porcelain. Do you, do you like them? Not my taste, but I vaguely remember my sister and I saving up for one of these when we were little. To right. Buy from them because she'd already got two or three of them at the time. So she's had them a long time. Right. Well, well, they've always been quite expensive items, but up until fairly recently, they, they haven't had a resale value no. or a collectible value. But like anything else, things do become old eventually. Yeah, yeah. And they, they become very collectible. And uh, the, the ones you tend to want, a little tip here, actually, when you get them with the word Bezic on, mm. it's pre-1989. Okay. This one actually says Royal Dalton, which is now owned by the Dalton factory, you see. Okay. The same moulds are used, but now produced by Dalton. All oh, right. Uh, the rarest one is a Canadian Mountie. All oh, right. He's worth about £2,000. <laughs> oh, I don't think we've got any of those. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the idea. The, the one-off, sort of small run, limited edition ones yeah. are the ones that people tend to collect. Oh. What we've got now really are some nice porcelain figurines Value-wise, sixty to hundred pounds for the price band. That's not bad. Not that bad right? at all. Yeah, I'm sure she'll be happy with that. Oh, great. Okay, future collectibles. <laughs> That's another sixty pounds in our kitty. But is Helen sure that her mum is happy for them to trot off to auction? Since she moved here, she hasn't been here very long, and Bezzy horses have just been sat in a drawer. So she's got other things she'd rather display. So the Bezic horses will go into the porcelain section of the sale, along with another piece of Worcester. This tusk vase, with its simulated branch handle, picked out with gilding, should attract lots of attention at auction, with an estimate of 100 to 150 pounds. The vase brings our total so far to 880 pounds. That's just under our target figure of 900 pounds. We need just one more item to tip the balance in our favour. And in the living room, I think I've found just the thing. Oh. This is nice. You've got a little piece of Lalique here, haven't you? Yes. That's yes, fantastic. Yes, Where did you get this from? Uh, a gift many years ago. Wow. Ah, uh, hello. Come on, we haven't got time to sit down. Ah, uh, well, actually, we have. Because oh. we found a piece of Lalique. Well, that's beautiful, isn't it? Now, René Lalique was probably the glass manufacturer of the 1920s, 1930s. Mm -hmm. And he was uh, very much into the old Art Deco scene. And he came up with a very clever material. Glass obviously has been around for a long time. But the way he treats the glass, it's called opalescence. And if you have a look at it, it gives different lights, different colours. And if you shine a light behind it, if I hold it up, can you see the orange sort of glow it gets? Yeah, yeah. On that one. And then if you show it onto the surface, it shows a, almost a violet blue. Yeah. So it's a, it's a wonderful material that he developed. It has this sort of milky glow in the middle. Now, lots of these were actually things like um, car mascots or paperweights. I mean, do you, do you know what this was used for originally? It was the lid of a box. Right. It got broken. Oh, dear, what a shame. I had it ground down to that shape to keep as an ornament. Right. Mm. But what we've got here, it should be marked. Yes, it is. Oh, it's a nice old one as well. We've got A La Ligue. Can you see yes, that? Yes. France. Now, the word, the word in France appears about 1927, 1928. Mm -hmm. So that gives us its start date. And then they got rid of the letter R, they just call it Lalique nowadays. 
in about 1945. So we now know that this piece was made between 1927 and 1945, so it's a good antique mm -hmm. item. Fabulous. How much do you think it's worth then? I think uh, it has been altered in some way, so I'm going to be a bit conservative. I mean, if it had been the complete box, it's very, mm. very good. As it is, um, at least 120, maybe 150 oh. pounds. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's great. <laughs> Is that all right? Yeah. Excellent. Fantastic, okay. eh? Mm. All right, great. Yeah. So how are we doing then? OK, well, we were doing very well. We'd already just about reached our target of £900, and that now just tipped us up to 1000 Hey! Yeah. <laughs> so, enough rummaging, because I think we've all had enough of that today, haven't mm. we? We've cleared out a lot of stuff, which I know you're yeah, delighted about. Yeah. And also we've got some really good prices, which you must be very pleased with. Absolutely. So now we'll pack all this off, send it off to auction and see what happens when the gavel comes down. Well, with Joy's fabulous treasures, we're hoping we'll enjoy lots of sales. There's been a real... Good tip for autumn birding. Just sit next to a tree like this. Not too close, but close enough to use your binoculars. And um, wait. Just wait, see what comes, and as a nibble. This is classic thrush food. At the moment there's blackbirds, which are, of course, thrush family anyway. And, oh! Now that's the first, that's a green woodpecker eating berries. I really don't think I've seen that, because green woodpeckers generally um, are on the floor. They're not pecking wood at all. They're sticking their beaks into short turf, using those big, long, sticky tongues and getting out ants and insects. But presumably he fancied a bit of veg with his meat. What else have we got in here? Crows. Oh, yes, they are. I was going to say, I'm not sure whether the crows are just perching or having a good view, but they are very photogenically eating berries. Quite delicate, really. Once one bird comes in, often friends join it. That's how birds work. Finding food. That's why they travel in flocks. Here's another one, just to prove it. One of the excellent things about Hampton Heath is the Corporation of London, who manage it, do know a lot about wildlife, and they chop trees down sometimes, they have to, but they leave them, and that is brilliant for fungi, because if there's one basic rule about looking for fungi, it's try and find dead trees, especially lying on the ground, logs and stuff like that. If they've been there a long time, they will be covered in fungi, almost bound to be. People will always say which are edible and which aren't, and they sometimes think mushrooms, edible, toadstools, not. That's completely nonsense. Some of them can make you very, very ill. Some of them can actually kill you. So I talk about how to watch wildlife. Well, I suggest you do just that. Just watch them. When you get to the end of autumn like this, things do begin to slow down and the fact is I haven't really seen very much active wildlife as it were but I'll tell you what you could do a lot worse than just stand and watch the leaves because with this wind getting up they ain't going to be here much longer
early February, the heath in winter, and uh, it can be very, very beautiful and very, very lively, but that's only if it snows. And I would love to have shown you that because this place is transformed. It's covered in people sledging and skiing and laughing and big coloured scarves. And, and the wildlife's livelier too because there would have been lapwings flying over and maybe geese or something like that. But that is only if the weather's really hard. And well, frankly, most of this winter it's been more like this just about every day. No snow, barely any frost, just uh, rather grey and gloomy, damp and dark. I must admit I don't get out here quite so often when it's like this. It's um, almost as if the heath closes down for a few months. Everything goes into black and white. As it happens, uh, most of the birds are in black and white too. Or they're black or white. And sometimes both. Ah, a lonely little kestrel. Probably one of the ones that was uh, practicing hunting. How's she getting on? Got her eye on something. What's she going to go for? Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. This is trouble. Magpie's going to harass. Leave her alone. She's just gently sitting there pretending not to notice there's a magpie creeping up behind her. And I'm willing to bet. Oh, you see. I was going to say I'm willing to bet the magpie has a go at her, but she he backed off, didn't he? Let's see what happens. A little confrontation to pass a gloomy winter afternoon. This is the standoff for pretending not that it's coming in again. Why do they bother? Magpies can't help it. They just have to be annoying. Parakeet, parakeet, you hear that? <whistles> oh, bless him. Trying to look nice and colourful and cheerful. You know, you can't help but be grateful because they're um, wild cousins, as it were, live in India. They must be tempted to go and join them. But they don't. They stay here and cheer up gloomy old Hampstead all the way through the winter. Oh, I know the winters are getting milder, but mind you, they breed them tough in Hampstead. say it's horrible out here right now and it's on days like this that you wonder will spring ever come
things I really love about this time of the year is that the trees are all at different stages. You've got some of them where the leaves are completely out, others that have barely got any leaves at all. And you can see up through the trees, there are masses of squirrels nibbling on buds and fresh spring leaves. You see, that's nice. You wouldn't get those shapes up on the branches in a few weeks' time because you wouldn't see the squirrels for the leaves. Stripping bark off the trees. Shredded bark. <laughs> Go on, get hold of it properly. Could be repairing the winter dray, or more likely um, converting it, because the spring dray is actually much lighter and airier than the winter dray. People are all surprised that I actually live in the city. Um, well, I like living in the city. I like being where it's at, as they say. I like the action. But I think if I didn't have a place like the Heath to escape to, I'd probably go totally nuts. Probably am totally nuts. exactly what I call peaceful here at the moment and yet I can shut all that out and watch the great crested grebes. That's lovely. Well, they haven't lost their libido. You can hear them calling even over the noise of that 707 or whatever it is coming in. This is amazing. One of them handing over a large piece of plastic as a love gift. Grebes are in the habit of giving presents to one another as part of the mating ritual, and it's usually a piece of nesting material. But this one has found what appears to be a plastic bag. Well, no, the other one's got the right idea. They're, look, 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 look. It's a twig, and they've swapped them over. That's fantastic. If I were asked, what is the most satisfying part of wildlife watching? It's watching my local patch. Watching it change from season to season, from year to year. And feeling, this is my place. So what's your favourite season? Is it summer? Is it autumn? Is it winter? Or is it my favourite, which is of course spring? For one reason only. Because that's time for spring watch and I love doing it! <laughs>